what would that be, 1400 BC? Well, it looks like I'm starting this podcast with an error. I mentioned 1400 BC and I meant 14th century BC when Nefertiti, Queen Nefertiti, helped rule Egypt. And I have a bust of her behind me, and that's why Paul Jacob and I were talking about it. And that's where our conversation starts today. This Week in Common Sense starts with a bust of Nefertiti. There we go. No, it's before my time. I'd have to ask my wife about that yeah. kind of time period. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you ready to go here? Uh, yes, I am. Yes, I am. I have to tell you before we go, I don't care whether this is on the podcast or not. But you know how we sometimes talk about disinformation and I'm, I like to be lighthearted and I like to be lighthearted with my kids and stuff. And throughout their growing up years, I would always say, well, no, mom's older than I am. And we were born in the same year. She was born in July. I was born in March. And so, you know, I'm older. Now the America knows that my kids are still not quite sure. My youngest told me, she, she said, I'm never quite sure which one of you is older. And I was like, yes, my disinformation campaign has succeeded. So, so I understand disinformation as a uh, partial practitioner, at least in my own, my own home on age related questions, age related questions. Well, I'm just a few months older than you, I think. Yes. I, and, you know, that's been confusing, too, because I thought you were a couple of years younger. And then all of a sudden it sounded like you were older. But but we don't have to divulge actual dates or anything on the air. But so. they could figure it out because we have talked about the fact that I wasn't required to oh. register for the draft. But you were. Yes. yes. I, we were time stamped at the factory around the same time yeah well we're still both baby boomers uh, this yeah. month or actually last week we had a great moment when a silent generation rock star uh, balked at having having spotify put his artwork you know his songs on right. the same station as the hated Joe Rogan, a disinformation artist. And then it's not being accused of uh, disinforming about his age. It's truly a matter of life and death, as according to Neil Young. And Neil Young lost that whole battle. Uh, so he's off. Well, he won. He got his he got his music off Spotify. And I have to say. Well, that's winning. I, that's a Pyrrhic victory because he got yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Uh, I went to check because I, you know, and boom, it's all gone. I'm a Neil Young fan i should take that back i'm a fan of neil young's music and so i'm sad it's not on spotify i'm even a little bit ticked off at neil young and and you know i guess you know he certainly has his right to his opinion i don't take that away he has every right to do whatever he wants to do with his music but again it it just seems like virtue signaling if he were to say Joe Rogan's wrong about this and when on March 26, he said, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But it's, it's, uh, I had a conversation with somebody today and we were talking about uh, some of the sports franchises or, or leagues and, and kind of their political wokeness. And I was mentioning that, you know, what bothered me about uh, Coca-Cola and MLB uh, you know, Major League Baseball pulling out of the, you know, uh, attacking the Georgia legislature on, a, on legislation that I think was, in general, a, a good thing, a step forward, not a step backward. Uh, don't agree with every little thing, but, but generally, I think good legislation. They opposed it, I believe, not because they had truly felt problems with the bill that they could articulate because they never articulated any of them. They did it to virtual virtue signal to be shown as a woke corporation. And, and so it's not a matter of whether you agree or disagree with the stand somebody takes, but when people take stands to take stands and don't really give a hoot about anything or understand anything, you know, then instead of being part of, a, of an overall robust discussion that's helpful in people coming to some consensus, 
they're hurtful. They're, you know, they're the people taking out somebody's legs because, oh, someone told me to, not because, you know, that person was wrong in some way. Yeah, it interests me when people decide that I'm not going to have anything to do with you because of A or B. Now, that's shunning. That's maybe, you know, putting people on a prison island. That's maybe killing them, whatever that is. It's a, it's a, it's a big line in the sand people draw. We all draw a line somewhere. I like to draw it when somebody's initiating force. That's that's the radical me. I we don't require so much of everybody. You know, we don't have to agree on much. I don't agree with all sorts of people that I'm very close to. Uh, you know, religion. Yes. As a person who reads philosophy, I have all sorts of weirdo notions, and I that I can attest notions. to that. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> no. But but nevertheless, I just don't see why you know the, the old line from Rodney King is why can't we all get along. Well, the reason is that people are requiring too much of each other, in my opinion. And Neil Young was requiring that that right. everybody agree with him on matters of COVID, even where even if he never really debates what the issues are. Right. Why doesn't he say stop listening to Joe Rogan and play my music instead? It's right there on Spotify. You don't have to go to Joe Rogan's podcast instead of cancel Joe Rogan. And, and, you know, part of it too is I, it would seem that life would be kind of boring if nobody ever had a different opinion on everything. If we're all standing in line, you know, 7 billion of us or however many there are now uh, standing in line to do the exact same thing. Cause that's what we all want to do. Um, you know, or, or, you know, 4 million guys are in love with the same woman, you know, it's like, this is not the way society should be. And, and so I, I think we want to be around people who disagree, who challenge us, us, us. Um, I have a lozenge cause I have a little uh, thing going on. So COVID probably, but. Yeah, everything's COVID now. Uh, can't be something else. Well, if I die, it'll certainly be from COVID, <laughs> even if it's being hit by a truck, but. You wrote five pieces this week. I did. Which And which ones do you want to start with? Two of them I want to talk a little bit about. The other uh, three, I want to send people that direction. But the first one uh, on Monday was specifically alarming. And that was about the poll that we did talk about, not at great length, but we, we kind of opened up last week because I had just gotten it on Friday and uh, or seen it, I think, then and and. It was the poll that was done. It's a Heartland Institute uh, Rasmussen Reports poll. And it found that, thankfully, two thirds of us do not want to put people in prison or fine them for simply publicly questioning the COVID position of the government and health officials. But sadly, horrifyingly, if this poll is at all accurate, and I don't, I don't have any reason to believe it's not, let's hope it's you know an aberration or some crazy thing, but I, I don't think so, unfortunately. 48% of Democrats, compared to 46% who felt the other way, but 48% of Democrats said, yes, we should imprison or fine people who publicly question the government. Oh, on COVID. But of course, once you say you can do it on COVID, well, maybe next will be religion. Uh, maybe next will be, it could be anything they want. Because once you establish the principle that, of course, the government and the majority should tell people exactly what to say and to think, you don't live in America. And 48% of the, of the Democrats in this country want to live in China, not in America. And they don't want, they want to live in China and they want Xi Jinping mm -hmm. to come on, let's do it all the way. Quit, quit pussyfooting around, Xi. You know, it, this, it's a horrifying thing. I tend to think that maybe the words tripped them up, that they're in kind of a whirlwind. And so there's, you know, maybe eight or 10 or 15% of that 48%. Is, is really, oh, I, I can't believe I said that. And, and let's salute 46% of Democrats who said, heck no, that wouldn't be America. But this is, this is scary. And of course, among Republicans, it was, you know, 80 something percent. Uh, no, of course not. But they were like 11%. 
And had this poll come back and 10% thought we should imprison and find people who say anything to question the government. And that was the terminology. It wasn't to tell some other cure or anything like that. It was the terminology was publicly questioned. So anyway, go read the, the piece. I, I talk about some more. There are links to that poll so you can see all of it, the wording, exactly how people came down, uh, broken out by other demographics as well, you know, uh, uh, race, uh, gender, that, that sort of thing. Um, the second commentary this week was China Trip Itinerary and Enos Cantor Freedom who plays basketball for my new favorite team, the Boston Celtics, has been invited by Yao Ming. Yao Ming is a retired uh, seven-foot guy from China, came, played for the Houston Rockets for years. Of course, it was the Houston Rockets that a a year or two back, uh, the GM or somebody working for the organization said, I stand with Hong Kong, fight for freedom. Uh, And all of a sudden, the NBA backed away. Um, and, uh, and, uh, oh, I'm going to space his name now, but, uh, uh, the King, uh, I can't believe I can't think of his name. It's like when you're on, you know, you're, you're it's like nerves or something, but I don't even but, know what you're talking about. The so basketball player, the, 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 the one that, if you said name one basketball player, this is the best Le- Le- LeBron James. Gee, oh, well, oh, he's the one that like, we don't say I Michael am, Jordan anymore. I'm going to be a hundred years old by the end of the show. Uh, it's LeBron James. It's just, it's like when you can't, it, my wife and I play Jeopardy and boy, it's, we recognize we're just not as fast. And sometimes it's two days later. Oh yes, that's what it, anyway, LeBron James came out and basically suggested this guy doesn't know what he's talking about and that he needs to watch what he's saying. Free speech is fine, but don't shoot off your mouth because LeBron James wants the genocidal murderers to give him money and don't get in the way of his money. He's woke and he's all about justice in the United States of America when it's not getting in the way of his money. But in China, where he's making big money too, he wants you to shut up because he's got deals with these guys. And so a bunch of Uyghurs are murdered or raped or sterilized or just browbeaten. The kids are taken away from their parents and put in foster homes and so on. Come on, he's trying to make a little money. And almost no one in mainstream media, certainly no one on the democratic side of media, no one, and I challenge anybody, you see anyone on the left, say a word about LeBron James kowtowing to China for his money and telling us to shut up so we don't interrupt his cash flow, you won't find a single one. And if you do, I will apologize on a future podcast, but I have not seen it and it's sickening. So Yao Ming to get to the commentary. These are why these take a long time. Uh, anyway, uh, Enos Cantor Freedom, he changed his name to Freedom. He's kind of into that freedom stuff. Gets invited by Yao Ming to come visit China because he's been saying bad stuff about China. Now, Enos Cantor, before he was Freedom, already had had a fight with Turkey because he didn't like the dictator there. He's very consistent about not liking dictators who throw people in prison for political reasons. And uh, anyway, so he, but he's been talking a lot about China and, and their attacks, you know, threatened attacks on Taiwan and what they've done in Hong Kong and so on. Yao Ming, who lives in China now and is a star, invites him to visit China. And he says, well, I'd be glad to if we can go visit the Uyghur concentration camps, re-education camps, I'd be glad if we can go to Hong Kong and let's let's see, let's talk to some people who want democracy. And then he also offered to take uh, Ming, uh, Yao Ming on a trip to Taiwan to see how a healthy functioning democracy works. Uh, anyway, go there. Links to more information. Uh, might enjoy the the uh, the story uh, in written form. And then uh, we also did one 
on uh, called VaxCon. And this is, this is something that we've talked about before. It doesn't get talked about enough, but there's a lot of people who are saying things that they are publicly questioning. The COVID position of the government, the change, changing COVID position, and they're always wrong to question, even as it changes from one end to the other end, they're, they're wrong the whole time. Anyway, um, but we've, we've, you know, we've talked about some of the different things people have argued, but we've also talked about the kind of mass hysteria that seems to be, you know, being promoted. And, uh, and of course, anytime you are silencing people, the opportunity for millions and millions and billions of people to be conned goes way, way, way up because you don't have the natural ability of people to go, hey, wait a second. So go read Vax Con question mark. You may want to remove the question mark, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, go read that. And that was Thursday's piece. Wednesday, we, uh, we talked about inflation. Inflation, my old friend. Uh, that's kind of what uh, President Biden suggested. It's called Who's the Stupid SOB? And, uh, and of course, uh, Peter Ducey had asked a question about inflation at at a train wreck, I mean, uh, uh, press conference that, that Biden held. They wonder why he doesn't hold more press conferences. Gee whiz, I, I, I wonder. Um, so at this press conference, he asked him about inflation. And Biden kind of says, oh, inflation is just fine. It's good for us. And then calls Peter Ducey, a uh, Fox reporter, a uh, stupid SOB. Uh, except he didn't say SOB. He, he set it out. Um, he didn't use uh, initials. And of course, there was a lot of hubbub about, oh, he said, you know, son of a, you know. But the real issue of import to me is the inflation. And, and it's hard to know. Maybe, maybe he was being facetious or, or sarcastic when he said, um, you know, that uh, inflation is good for us. Maybe he meant the opposite. But what's interesting to me is that inflation isn't bad for everyone, probably. For instance, if you are earning money and you owe $100,000 on your house, you have a really small house, or you've paid a whole bunch on it already, but let's just use that nice round number. And all of a sudden, your salary's doubled, all the other prices in the world are doubled, but your house price isn't doubled because you got that under a contract that it can't go anywhere. Well, now it's twice as easy to pay that. And, and so that's great for you. And if that was your only expense, uh, hey, inflate all day long, this is wonderful. Now, obviously, if you're the, the bank, that holds that mortgage <laughs> and, and now people are, yeah, here's your $200,000. I've got 10 hundred, you know, I've got 70 trillion here trying to get a loaf of bread. Here's your money. It's not good. And so um, the, you wonder why does Washington act certain ways? Why do they do certain things? Why, you know, and we have to ask why there's inflation. And of course, Tim, you're the better economist by far. Uh, and so you can weigh in on that. But part of the reason that they do the things they do is because they work for them. At least they think it's going to work for them. And I submit that it often does. Years ago, I remember writing about all the terrible things in, in, uh, in you know, Congress and the bad approval rating, and everything else. But they all come to Congress and they make a bunch more money. They make a bunch of stock trades that are great. They, you know, I mean, it's this society may not be working for you or for me, but it's working for them. So you, you can't really say they're stupid. They may not be your favorite people and they're not mine, but they're not stupid. They, it is working for them. And I submit that inflation uh, works a lot better for the ruling class 
than it does for the rest of us. Well, that's almost certainly why we have it, because all that debt, it's certainly helping some people. And of course, it's not the banks who usually take the hit. It's who, some depositors who take the hit. Banks, I think, are kind of insulated by the Federal Reserve and practices like that. So it's a, I'm, I'm on your side. But what exactly Biden meant, I really don't know. He misspeaks so often. And, you know, it's no longer an aberration. It's, it's Biden. Sometimes people misspeak. And uh, he's up in years and, and, you know, people can argue about his, you know, degenerative, uh, degenerative, you know, loss and so on. But the, all we know for certain is he has trouble saying the right stuff sometimes. It seems like in that sort of situation, it would be good to be asking follow up questions and to find out exactly what he means by that. And again, our media doesn't seem to be that interested. I mean, you, you've got so you got Fox, you've got some folks on the right who are going to play up any of it, and then they're going to ask tough questions and try to get something else they can play up. But you're going to have most of the media, the New York Times and the Washington Post, and the and the other all the other networks, and and I don't know how many households One America News or or some of these others, you know, or Newsmax hit, but I think. You know, NBC and CBS and, and ABC are hitting more. And, and you know, they're not covering any of it. They're not really into if it could if it could shed a bad light on the president. They're not interested in the story. That's, you know, remember the watchdog media? It's like, no, it's a partisan media now. And to the and if you're listening to talk radio, well, you're going to hear. Plenty of stuff about how, you know, what the Democrats are doing that's not good. If you're watching broadcast news, you're going to hear almost nothing except how good the Democrats are doing and how terrible and evil the Republicans are. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's okay to be free and to do and for them to speak as they want, but we're not getting good information. And, I, and it's not just because they're partisan. In some ways, if they were honest about being partisan, it would help listeners and viewers. But it seems like we have, well, we've, we've written the, the, the piece after uh, Glenn Greenwald said it, but uh, that, you know, it, it used to be we worried that the media was being influenced and manipulated by the CIA and the deep state. And now the media sort of is the CIA and the deep state. So, and one of the things that interested me here was that even Fox News, it was a Fox reporter who asked the inflation question, and even Fox News in the covering of the insult was only interested in the insult and not in what he meant, what you concentrated on. They were not interested in the inflation angle. So I didn't see any follow-up on that. They didn't even, I didn't even see any speculation on what Biden meant. It was all yeah. about calling. It was all about calling the young Mister Ducey as opposed to the old Mister Ducey, uh, a son of. A it's all you know. It's kind of clickbait, and and we have to we have to get more sophisticated as a you know as a society, I guess, in <clears throat> in not always clicking on the clickbait and and also not spending a whole lot of time. Whether he called them an SOB or not, I mean, it was on an open hot mic or whatever. Oh, the suspense is killing me. Really? It was on an open mic. Oh, we're so lucky to know that the president says, son of a, you know, uh, I, I don't even say it, see, because I'm a nice guy. My mom loves me. Anyway, um, and she might listen to this and go, what? Paul, you said what? Anyway, um, but let's worry less about you know, what, what stupid thing the, the president says next, and let's get at what he's really doing. And there's been almost no discussion of how we got to inflation uh, like we have now. And I don't know if that's because so many people just instinctively know that when the government that's running huge deficits decides, well, we spend an extra three trillion over here. Oh, and here's another three or four trillion we could spend over here. That if that's going on, how does that money, where, where are they getting it? And 
when all of a sudden that just just splurged into society and prices start to go up, I know that you can blame the oil companies or this or that, but I don't know that anybody's buying it. But what's, what's strange is there's no discussion of it. There's no serious discussion that I've seen in the, you know, I'm sure if you went to some sort of economic journals, you could, you know, or, or that sort of thing, you could see more. But for people who are not looking into the, you know, the economics of it, other than just the basic, okay, how, how did we get here? From a political standpoint, it's not really being discussed. There was one article in a major paper, I think it was the New York Times, but could have, could have been the Wall Street Journal, I don't remember, that covered how economists were surprised by the inflation. And their <laughs> argument, they went through a, an elaborate listing of, you know, what, what happens when you have a recovery but limited supply, blah, blah, blah. And throughout the whole article, not one mention you guessed it, not one mention of the money supply. Yeah. They don't talk about deficits. They don't talk about uh, monetary policy. If they can at all, uh, if at all possible, they want to attribute inflation and inflationary moves in the economy to something other than the thing that it most likely is. And has been known, you know, for hundreds of years by economists. Right. I mean, there's a general consensus among monetary economists that, monetary policy is the main cause of inflation. And and we're, we're talking about inflation. In fact, the old definition of inflation was actually just simply an increase in the money supply. Right. But because consumer price inflation is what we're usually concerned about, uh, that's what they call inflation. And then then there's all these problems of with uh, reporting on it. How do you record right. what right. is the proper rate of inflation? Well, there probably has never been a rate of inflation. I know the economists... Are, occasionally debate this, but I don't really think there's a rate of inflation so much as a bunch of different rates in different sectors doing different things because they all have different relationships to we something I mentioned earlier, who gets the money first from an inflationary monetary policy. That is that's that's where that's where that the insider outsider thing is. Uh, that's it leads to what are called Cantillon effects. Is that the the economy is not so much going one direction or another, but going many different directions and how they relate stabilizes or destabilizes. And it's that relation of relative prices that's the, the interconnectedness of all things is that really, really matters. And when we talk about inflation rates, we sometimes lose track of that. But at the beginning of economics, like in the 1700s, in Richard Cantillon's a great essay, he mentions how complicated and how interesting the process was. And he'd have a reason to because he was in on the great crime of the uh, bubble, the first French monetary bubble, paper money scandal. He was in on that with the John Law business. Fascinating character because he allegedly died uh, in his bed, set afire by his uh, employees. So, oh. But there are some people believe that actually uh, he... Uh, escaped that he had somebody else burned in his own bed and he left for Indonesia. So there's a mystery at the beginning of economics is the richest man of the time, the man who made the most money off of the inflation of the early 1700s uh, may have actually survived his. Uh, Seems like a, a time in, in our world in which running off to Indonesia might have been more difficult than today. Yeah. But a more successful, if done, is that <laughs> yes, you that might have too. stayed unknown. If and of course, I don't know the why the, the biographer who believes this believes this, but that is the scuttlebutt. So it's an interesting tale. Well, we had we had one more commentary this week uh, where we're really, you know, we haven't spent much time on this. Although I keep you hear things all the time about crime, and we've seen these videos. We've done a, a, a few commentaries about it at different points but it's just there's so much of it you could write one every day um but this idea that you know if you're just stealing a little bit it's not that big a deal uh california reduced their level that it would be a felony to steal from you know i i think it was 400 some 50 dollars to 950 uh there's all these da's around the country who seem to think that the way 
to, you know, get rid of this over policing and over incarceration is to let people who rob a store with a gun uh, be just petty larceny and a misdemeanor. And it, it, it strikes me, we've seen this, you know, uh, we have written many, many times about the drug war and how that has created a situation in which lots of people are going to prison who are not committing violent crimes. And, and granted, in the drug trade part of it, the higher up you go, the more these folks, if, if they weren't in this illegal trade, they'd find another illegal trade to get in. So I recognize that these people aren't all, you know, just into a drug and, and so on. They're, they're part of a criminal gang at a certain level. But, um, but at the street level, it's insane what we've been doing. And we're putting all these people in jail and ruining their life because they, you know, had a drug problem or didn't even have a drug problem. We're at some concert with a, you know, and someone handed them a joint and then they got arrested. This is, to me, if we have too many people in prison, we are imprisoning people for things that they shouldn't be going to prison for. And, and you take those off the books um, or you, or you have a, a, a system that takes care of that. But, but if, if someone were to say, Hey, there's some crimes that shouldn't be crimes, would armed robbery be one that would come to mind? Oh yeah. Why are we, why are we making such a big deal out of this guy coming in with a gun and saying, I'll shoot your head off if you don't give me all your money. I mean, we ought to be going after the person who, you know, used fertilizer on his lawn and then mowed it and some of the clippings, you know, weren't properly cleaned up. That's who ought to be going down for felonies and maybe bring back the death penalty. We live in an insane world. It's gotten so insane that even Democrats, liberal Democrats in places like San Francisco have figured out that this is crazy. Um, and it's London Breed, She's kind of an interesting name. That's the name of the, the woman who is the mayor of San Francisco. And she came out and kind of said, enough is enough. In fact, she even said something about, we've got, we've got to stop tolerating the BS. And she said it out. You know, I still have my mother watching. So I, but, but she, apparently her mother doesn't watch her on TV. And so she said it straight out. And to listen to, the mayor of San Francisco start to just be outraged by the complete willingness to let anything go on and to allow people who are doing productive, honest living to be you know, run over by people who are defecating on a public street or harassing them to give them money or sexually harassing them. You know, there are people on the street in San Francisco who should be arrested and not be on the street. And, you know, there's plenty of people on the street all over the country in different places. They don't deserve to be arrested. But I can tell you, I've, I have run into bums and, and they're bums. That's what they are. Um, not everyone who's homeless. I'm talking about the people I've bumped into on the street in San Francisco. They're not good people. And, uh, you know, I've bumped into good people too. It's gotten so outrageous that it started to impact members of Congress who, you know, are almost carjacked and this person and that person. And so when it was happening to all the little people like you and me, well, come on, it's this. Why, why get all upset? Why put people in jail? We've got an over incarceration problem. Um, and the people who might go to jail might not have the right racial background. We've got to rethink all this, defund the police. <laughs> Those who are living in these sitting, cities and trying to run these cities are starting to say, oh, my goodness, we can't do that. And I don't in this piece called Stop and Go on Crime. I don't mention this aspect of it that strikes me as odd. Why did the Democratic mayor of San Francisco and a former Democratic mayor, Michael Nutter in Philadelphia, who, who raised a hand and said, this is garbage that's going on now, and, and took on the DA in Philadelphia, 
by name and read him the riot act. Why are they picking up on this before the news media picks up on what a problem this is? And I'm going to suggest there are two reasons for that. One, these people are more dialed in to the grassroots of their cities than are the media people covering those cities. Just an observation. Seems to be true in this case. Maybe in others, too. The other thing is something we have long said here, which is the national press corps. I'm not talking about every single city in every case, but the national press corps is decidedly to the left of the Democratic Party. We've seen the Democratic Party move left. They cannot catch up with the Democratic news media. The pro-democracy, really pro-Democrat news media. And so they didn't catch up because they're, way, they're farther out on that wing where nobody is than the politicians. So, you know, I, I haven't done a study, uh, you know, but that's my observation is that one of the takeaways is that the, the news media doesn't see something like this. And to me, that reinforces my conclusion that they are, that they're, they're becoming almost worthless in giving us, and, and we need it, so much of the information we have. I was about to say they're becoming completely worthless as far as information. Well, that's not quite true because we, I mean, otherwise we'd be completely in the dark. But if you're not reading between the lines, if you're not realizing, look, if, if they are telling you this, you know, they're not going to tell you that. And, and, you know, COVID, which we had one thing about the vax con uh, this week, the biggest problem I have, um, you're more down on these vaccines than I am. But all I know is if, if I have no faith that they'll tell me the truth, I have no faith that if there are, and we've seen some cases where there are more problems than we are being told about. So I'm not for a vaccine where there are more, more, you're more likely to have bad outcomes from taking the vaccine than from getting COVID. And, and we, we don't know going in. Um, and they rushed this vaccine and so on. Well, look, if it works, then I'm glad they rushed it. If it doesn't work, well, then I'm not so glad. But you know what? Sometimes in life, things don't work out. That's what science is kind of all about. Let's keep testing because maybe we may miss something. Once you stop testing, once you stop people from saying, hey, wait a second, I've got, I've got some information, I've got a different view, you're lost. And that to me is what's so scary. We are lost. I have no way to judge in any sort of, of confidence that I'm being told the truth about the dangers of the vaccine, the plus, the, you know, and, and so that is, that's a very, very scary situation. Well, you have uh, covered all five pieces and maybe in record short time. Well, hey, that's, that's good. But I have two thoughts this week that I wanted to mention. Okay. And one of them, one of them doesn't really apply necessarily uh, to any of the scripts, you know, in, in a clear way, but it's Thomas Jefferson, that, that slaver, but who said some really good things um, and wrote some. He says the legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious, injurious, injurious. I, maybe I said it right the first time to others. <laughs> it's where you injure others. I know that much. I don't know how to talk, but but it does, but it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no God. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. And that is. Such basic, clear, libertarian philosophy that you have to understand if someone else does something that really actually injures you, they, their car runs over your toe, uh, you know, they pollute their backyard and you can prove that the chemicals seeped over and made you sick. But if someone has a different belief or says something you don't like, where, you know, it's as simple as turning the channel. I remember how many times my parents would say about different things, 
You could just turn the channel. And, and But that's lost. You never hear that anymore. Oh, no, no. You have to take over the entire world and force everyone to do exactly what you want. So I like that one. I noticed that it really was translated for kids in the little, uh, what do we call it? I don't know, a little poem. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. That's basically the same theme. It's actually not any yes. different. Yes. And he actually uses the break your legs, so the, the break your bones is right there. I wonder which came first. You know, that's a good question. I would think break your bones, but I'm not so sure that, you know, I don't know. I have one more, though, that we had this week that I really like. I have a feeling you like it, too. And it's Henry David Thoreau saying, some circumstantial evidence is very strong, as when one finds a trout in the milk. It's yes. a great image. I mean. Yes, it was. And it actually probably had something to do with a scandal in milk production in Massachusetts at his time. And uh, there was, you know, it was one of those questions of uh, uh, adulterating the product is that there was a sort of a scandal at that time. Yes. And they were wondering if the farmers were doing something wrong and even why they would add trout to milk. I don't know. I think that that was Thoreau. That was his <laughs> addition to the whole issue. <laughs> well, it was, it was something that you, you couldn't really explain as a natural happenstance and uh but I see it kind of in more figuratively, I guess. Right. When you think about things like, well, Facebook has to regulate things. And then you realize that for a year, and of course, it wasn't just Facebook. It was YouTube. It was all kinds of things. It was the U.S. government telling them lies. But that they censored anything about the lab leak. And then a year later, say, oh, oh, we're going to allow those now that it's pretty obvious that that seems to be how we got this thing. Um, or at least it's as likely or more likely than any other, uh, right. you know, idea. And then they're censoring something else and everyone's kind of a blur. Well, you can't allow people to say they just got finished censoring something. And then, but of course, when they allowed people to again, talk about the lab leak theory, they did not apologize. They should have come out. In fact, we should it should be so demanding. They, the Facebook, all the workers, we should be trying to think of how we can help them now that they're out of a job. That's what it should be, that everyone who works for Facebook is going, how did I get out of a job? We went bankrupt so fast because we shouldn't put up with what they are doing. And instead, they've got such a, and I know I'm, I'm on Facebook we this is common sense is on Facebook or it's common sense with Paul Jacob on Facebook. And we feel like we have to be to reach people to be competitive in the in the marketplace. But boy, we have to change that dynamic. And it's very easy. I mean, I feel it myself. It's very easy to, you know, hey, let's keep doing what we're doing is a lot easier. But we've got to find a way to build presences. Well, th this podcast is now we're always promoting it on Rumble. We, we don't even always put up the full thing on, on uh, YouTube. And that's because we've got we've to make that switch. And it's not just a matter of, boy, I'm mad at Facebook or I'm mad at, at YouTube. They're ruining not just our country, the world. I see China, this totalitarian, anti-speech, regulate, track, film, control, in, in an Orwellian, in Orwell wasn't even close. I mean, it just in a, in a terrible way. And then you see so much of it being repeated in the United States of America. And you recognize that literally a plurality of, of Democrats thinks the government ought to be arresting people for their questions about the government. This is, this is, Really, really scary stuff. And on that happy note, we're done. At least people still talk about it. And we don't have to pay the price that uh, some people do who talk about it in other places. Well, that's for sure. At least for now. Yeah. So we conclude January 2022. Yes, it's over. I'm taking Monday off. Very good. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. But I wish I was. <laughs>